Okay, it looks like uh, 2 o'clock is rolled around. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is maybe a little less structured than I usually have in the past lectures. Uh, when I've done uh, the hands-on exercise 3, in most cases, I usually find that uh, at various points people come up with questions on, you know, what if I want to do this or what if I want to do that with the model. And and so what I did is I've come up with a few examples here that illustrate some variations on uh, on sort of the basic uh, population PK model that uh, that we did as part of example three uh, to talk about how you accomplish certain things because some of them in particular are not necessarily obvious how you would uh, implement them using wind bugs. So uh, I thought I'd go through a, a a list of some of those and illustrate how you can do them. Uh, and the one I was going to start out with is is dealing with variations on the structure of the variance matrix used for inter-individual variability. And, and, and if you recall, when we did hands-on example 3, it had a full block variance matrix for all five of the PK parameters. So we had clearance, uh, distribution clearance or Q. We had the two volumes of distributions plus KA, and had a um, and had a full five by five variance matrix with uh, all all elements in the matrix being estimated. And frequently, you may choose to want to break that up in different ways. Uh, you know, for example, if you're doing a PKPD model, you might choose to use full variance matrix only for the PK parameters, and then a second one for the PD, but not have correlations between them. Anyway, to illustrate that, what I was going to do is just take our hands-on example 3 uh, and eliminate some of the covariance terms in there and show how you can implement that. Uh, within wind bugs. And the example I'll show you here is one where I'll still keep a, uh, actually, is this, oh, uh, where I will keep a full variance matrix only for clearance and the central volume of distribution. Uh, I will still include inter individual variation on Ka but I won't have it correlated with any of the other parameters. And finally, I will have no uh, unexplained inter-individual uh, variation in either Q or V2. So you can see I've written that in this way, so where I'm going to say that the log of the three parameters that we have IIV in, the clearance V1 and Ka, uh, that's still going to, I've written it here as a multivariate normal, but notice that some of the covariance terms in the matrix are zero. Uh, so here's our covariance matrix, and I've got a zero here, 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 and here, namely in all the places where uh, there might be a covariance between Ka and the other parameters. So here, so another way you can look at this then is that Ka can be described as just a univariate normal distribution, and then the uh, clearance and V1 can then be described as a bivariate normal distribution where we still will estimate some possibly non-zero covariance term in here. So how will we go about implementing that? Well, I, uh, for those of you that have caught that already, I've on the uh, course website, I've posted actually, I think it was five different uh, examples of different kinds of models, but in particular there's one there that I named this, so it's ME hands-on 3 called PBIIV. I guess the PBI intended to mean like partial block inter-individual variance. So let's go ahead and take a look at that uh, and see how we implement this kind of a model. Okay, let's see. i got a clean slate here. Let's open it up. Uh, Okay, so here's our uh, MI250. 
uh, folder here and uh, if you download those I set them up as zip files that when you unzip them you will get these various folders but in particular for the uh, ME hands-on 2 hands-on 3 PBI IV uh, that we've got right here let's uh, show you what's in there uh, actually I got some extraneous junk that we can get rid of oh I didn't want to copy those let's do the undo copy go ahead and delete those they're just hit they should be hidden files but they're not when I look at them here okay so let's take a look at what the uh, where the main difference here which is going to be in the uh, the bugs model here and you can see that right here it's got the .txt uh, extension on it let's go ahead and open that up inside bugs here okay Okay, so uh, there's there's actually more than one way to skin this particular cat. There's different ways you could do it, but I'll show you one particular way uh, that I did here. And a lot of this is just kind of bookkeeping to keep track of uh, where the different components uh, that you're ultimately still going to have to pass to the bugs model library function. So, in fact, let's maybe before I even show you the final oops that's not what I wanted it to do there we go uh, so remind you here so what we're ultimately trying to do is we're we're still going to be using this 2CPTKA model and I still need to pass it all of my parameter values for individual J here are going to have to get passed in uh, as a single vector so so we can have all kinds of names for various parameters before we get there but in the end I've got to pull them all together in a single vector so that's kind of where the bookkeeping comes in so let me go to the top here uh, by the way notice the comments maybe at the top here because I just remembered there was one other thing I was going to show you is while we did this uh, so first of all I'm going to illustrate implementing our model that where only a subset of the parameters have correlation uh, in them and in particular the clearance and volume something else I'll show you when we finish that is show you an alternative way of structuring the likelihood function uh, before I had it set up where the observations uh, where where you had a separate loop over observations from the loop over subjects what I've done in this particular example is I'll show you how you can alternatively you can actually embed that loop inside the loop that goes over subjects uh, and in some ways it might be slightly more readable in addition it it removes the need to even have one particular um, item in your data set uh, we always had this number of observations object you don't need it in this case okay anyway let's we'll get to that in a minute so first of all remember we want a bivariate normal for our log clearance and log v1 uh, and that's what's going on right here so this is very much like you saw before where if you remember in the original hands-on three I just called all of this stuff log theta uh, and I had a 5 by 5 uh, matrix over here well now it's just a 2 by 2 because we're just going to have a 2 by 2 variance matrix to describe our clearance and volume and I used a name here that maybe might be a little more descriptive where I put CLV1 in here to indicate that, that we're talking about the combination of clearance and uh, the central volume so we've, so we've still got our DM norm. I called the mean here log CLV1 mean, excuse me, for the jth subject here. Again, there's going to be two, uh, two components to that, one for clearance and one for volume. And then our 2 by 2 matrix. Uh, I need to define what this log clearance V1 mean is uh, in terms of our our clearance hat and our v1 hat and that's what's going on in this next two statements right here so you can see this is pretty much like you saw before I've got log clearance hat 
This is going to equal 0.75 times the log of our weight over 70. So that's just like before. Uh, same thing for the volume of distribution. So these are pretty much the same as we did before. It's just that there's only the two of them uh, that are in there. So we do our bivariate normal. Uh, separately here, I do another call to a normal distribution for Ka. Since it's not correlated with anything, I just used a univariate uh, normal distribution there. Uh, and recall in the uh, example I said we were going to do, we were going to have no unexplained uh, inter-individual variation in Q and V2. They would just be related according to uh, these allometric relationships to body weight. So we've just got, you know, our log QJ then is just going to be our log Q hat plus 0.75 times the log of weight over 70 and then uh, log V2, log V2 hat plus the log of weight over 70. So, but we don't need to make any, <coughs> don't mean need to make any calls to any uh, probability distributions for those. And then the next step is after I've done that, I just kind of have to collect everything together here uh, and put them in a, in a single vector that I'm going to be passing uh, to, uh, to our bugs model library function. So that's what you see going on here. So I could have written it, well, you see I wrote it this way where I put the log on the left-hand side. So we, we're going to want the... Uh, Okay, theta j1, so in other words, that's going to be the uh, first parameter here for the jth subject. That's going to be related to uh, the first element of our CLV1. In other words, it's going to be related to the individual specific value of clearance. Uh, the second one is related to Q. Uh, the next one to our central volume here, so that's why the 2 right here. Uh, and then we've got our V2 and our Ka all pulled together using uh, the name as we did before. I'm just calling it theta then for the vector of parameters for the J subject. So basically you're free to pretty much do whatever you want to up here to describe your uh, to describe the individual specific model parameters. It's just that at some point you got to bring them all together uh, into a single vector for that particular individual. Uh, and then the next bit down here is just repeating all of that for doing our simulations to do our population predictions. So the only difference here is you'll see I stuck pred on, on several of these. Uh, and then down here I've pulled together all my f's and t lags that I need to have as part of my theta vector that we're going to pass to the bugs model library function. So that's that's most of the story that changed uh, from the hands-on three example. Again, it's just, you know, you can just use whatever names you like up here. You just have to pull it all together at some point down here into a common vector. Uh, and finally, this is the calls you see here are identical to what you saw in the hands-on three example right there. Uh, and that pretty well takes care of, of that. Um, you know, if you wanted, you could take this one step further. For instance, here I could have had, maybe I might have said, well, instead of having no unexplained inter-individual variation in Q and V2, I could have also had another bivariate normal. So maybe I would allow them to be correlated with each other, but not with clearance V1 or Ka. And again, I would have another bivariate normal. Uh, down here to deal with that. Uh, the other thing that's different here uh, that I was talking about is instead of having a separate loop outside of the loop that goes over subjects that steps over all of the individual observations, instead I took advantage of the fact that we've already created this start and end, you know, the start and end vector describing where each subject's data begins and ends. Uh, once I have that, it's actually pretty easy to to put the loop that goes over the observations and nest that inside uh, the loop that goes over subjects. So what I'm doing here, you can see, is I'm going to say for i goes from 
uh, start J. In other words, it's going to go from wherever the data begins for subject data to wherever it ends for subject J, and then does all the calls uh, as we did before uh, for uh, for going over the you know over calculating the individual data. So we've got our usual. I've got in this case my uh, log normal residual variation. Uh, here I calculate my C hat from the uh, amount in the uh, central compartment divided by the volume of distribution in the central compartment for the jth individual. One thing that changed here is if you recall when we went from, you know, when I had it like from i equals 1 to n obs, I had to use a nested index in here. So I had to say theta and then I had to have, um, uh, what did I have in there? I, I would have had uh, an, an ID variable inside my data set. I think I called it subject uh, before, so it would be like subject J. Well, you don't need to do that here. In fact, you don't even need to have uh, a subject column in your data set any longer. That, that becomes unnecessary. Uh, that's taken care of by just stepping over the individual subjects in this loop. So, let's see, is there any other change? Uh, I think that's pretty much it. So, again, the point here was mainly to illustrate how to deal with other, um, you know, sort of other variant structures in here, but at the same time I also showed you this other way of structuring the individual components here. In terms of the R script that goes with this, it isn't a lot different. Uh, it has to be a little bit different to deal with the different variant structure we have. Let me go ahead and open up R. Okay, the first parts are all pretty much the same. And let's see, where would it have changed here? Well, one thing, as I pointed out, that's changed is I no longer need uh, this element in the data set. I don't have to have a an individual identifier any longer. That becomes unnecessary. Uh, so we got rid of that. Uh, I also didn't have to say how many observations there were. That's already kept track of by the start and end uh, vectors that we've passed in. So that doesn't. So that's not needed. Uh, of course, we had to change down here. Uh, before we had, I think I had called it omega, what did I call it? Probably om just omega inverse prior. Here I just gave it a different name, omega CLV1 inverse prior. Uh, and here, uh, this number here where I have a 2 and this where I have a 2 used to be 5's, so I now change them to 2. In other words, the number of dimensions of the variance matrix we're using. Uh, so that I changed, uh, and the initial estimates then change correspondingly. So we've got right here, uh, I've only got a 2x2 two two variance matrix now uh, that I put for my initial estimate there. I also have to provide a, uh, uh, an initial estimate for the, uh, for the precision for our inter-individual variation in Ka. Let's see, I think that's all the difference other than just being consistent with the names when I when I ask for what I want monitored. Other than that, it's all the same story. Uh, actually, I, I ran this, but I don't think I saved the results in here, so I won't be able to show you those. Uh, maybe if, uh, I guess if you wanted a little exercise to think about would be to go ahead and run this example and uh, go ahead and compare things like the expected deviance and the and maybe the deviance information criteria to see uh, to what extent uh, is the model fit, uh, you know, to what degree does it degrade when we simplify the variance, uh, variance matrix in this way. Okay, I don't think there's much more of a story to tell on that. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Maybe before I do that, I'll just stop and take a quick breath, see if there's any questions on this one. OK, 
Okay, nothing showing up yet here. Let's, uh, why don't I wander up to our, uh, up to our next one. I'll keep an eye out and see if any question pops up in case somebody's typing something long. Uh, okay, let's go to the next topic in here. Um, yeah, when we did the hands-on three example, uh, we assumed that each individual's parameters were constant with respect to time. Uh, so once you know, once we identified an individual specific parameter, it didn't change with time. But question comes up: What if one or more parameters does vary with time in some fashion? Uh, and as an example, what I'm going to do is use the same model as example three. Uh, well, and it remind you, in example three, uh, the only covariate we brought into the model was body weight, and and we used the baseline body weight uh, throughout throughout the model. What if we thought it was appropriate to use not baseline body weight, but whatever the current body weight is? Uh, as the covariate in our model. So maybe the body weight is varying over time. Uh, now for a short-term PK model, it's probably not of much interest, but maybe if you're doing, you know, some, you know, maybe some PD model where you're going over maybe a much longer period of time, uh, you know, or if you're dealing with a pediatric study uh, where body size is changing, you know, possibly... Uh, you know, by a f maybe a substantial amount over the course of a of a study, especially if it's a study on the order of months or uh, you know, or even a year. You know, you may need to take it into account. But for now, let's as an example, let's just use our example three, except we're going to make the parameters functions not of the baseline body weight, but of the current body weight. And in particular, we're going to treat the body weight and consequently the model parameters that depend on it, we're going to treat them as piecewise constant functions of time. Uh, and the model, and I've actually implemented then that model, uh, is uh, what I called ME2 hands-on 3 TDP for time-dependent parameters. Um, now, the reason we can do this is because uh, just like non-MEM or, you know, PREDPP in particular, uh, Bugs Model Library uh, will allow you to treat the model parameters as piecewise constant. Uh, it won't let you use a more complicated uh, continuous model of time. Uh, the only way you could do a uh, more complicated one uh, simply uh, using any of the built-in models is you'd actually have to sort of break up the uh, the time scale so that you could approximate, you know, you could use the piecewise constant function as a, as a better approximation of continuous. Otherwise, you'd have to resort to using uh, one of the uh, models where you write the model out in terms of differential equations, and then you could have an, a, a, con, a continuous uh, change in the parameter values with time. But for now, let's just do piecewise constant. So let's see how we can implement that. Uh, actually, maybe even before I do go to the model itself, let me take a jump backwards to when we described uh, the bugs model library. Uh, let's see right there. And somewhere in here. Okay, and here's where things crop up, is right in this section right here. Now, the way we've been passing parameters so far in the examples we've looked at is we pass the parameters, our theta vector here, as just a vector of parameters with length equal to the number of model parameters. So for each individual, you just pass a simple vector. But if you want to allow for the possibility of time-dependent parameters, uh, you can alternatively pass theta in as a matrix. And, and when you do that, the number of rows, you know, basically the rows correspond to time. So the number of rows would have to be equal to our time vector that's, uh, that we're passing to the function. And the columns then correspond to our different 
parameters. So in particular, the ith row within this matrix then would, would represent a vector of model parameters, and that vector of model parameters would be the values that are used to predict the concentrations or predict the amounts in each compartment for the interval going between the i minus first time and the ith time. So that's the, the general theme here that we're going to be using in order to make this work is we're going to construct such a matrix. So let's take a look about at how we might do that. Okay, let's close that guy out for now. Uh, let's see, ditto here. And let's go to ME2 hands-on 3 TDP. Uh, let me grab the one with the TXT extension. Okay, so this is now going to be a modification of ME2 hands-on 3. Again, the key difference here is I'm now going to uh, to use not the weight, not weight at the baseline, but we're going to be using each individual weight. So now I got to remember how I did this. Okay, so uh, the way I set this up is now we're not going to want to ha run our, uh, you know, our call to get our random effects for each individual time. We're going to only call that once per individual here. Uh, and so, so we still, we're going to loop over individuals. We're going to call what I just referred to it as log theta norm here. Uh, to call that, and this is still going back to the one where we're using the full 5x5 five five, uh, variance matrix here. So we've got uh, correlation amongst all of our parameters here. Uh, and that's going to be, you can think of this log theta norm. Well, just be, like before, previously, the what I call log theta, what did I call it? Log theta hat? No, it wasn't log theta hat. Um, oh, that's right. I, I'm forgetting how I did this before. I'm doing this sort of in the opposite order. Uh, what I'm doing now is I'm going to use what I call log theta mean is uh, the same thing, I guess, as I call log theta hat before. Uh, that thing then, so that would be like the mean for a 70 kilogram person uh, in this instance. I'm going to generate individual specific values, but these are sort of individual specific values for like hypothetical 70 kilogram people. Uh, and then I'll add the weight modification afterwards. And that's the simplest way to deal with it in this instance. Uh, so you can see on the right hand side of these, uh, of each one of these things, I've got the log theta norm. So I've got this individual specific value of that, just like I, just like I generated above. What did I, oh, somewhere along the line I hiccuped there and added something. Okay, so I've got my log theta norm right here uh, for the, and this corresponds to our clearance and then I add my weight modification and notice here it's weight I. It's not it's not weight start I, it's weight I and I forgot to mention this is all right now inside of a loop that's going from start J to NJ. In other words it's going over the basically over all the observations for for individual j in here uh, and I do this for all then all of my parameters of course in the ka it's to some degree redundant but again I still got to shove these all into a common when in this case is a common matrix uh, for this for this one uh, and then Where am I going here? Okay. Let's 
Sorry, I was just trying to think through something here. I was trying to remember. Okay. And then finally here I uh, put them all together, bring my Fs and my T lags in here as before. Again, someday I'll figure out a way to just have a default to those without you having to write it, but for the most but you still have to here, so I just do my usual ones and zeros for the time being here. Uh and and that will create now uh my my thetas here, and let me make sure I actually did this right here. Okay, yeah, we're still fine. I just remembered. I, I was thinking I was I have done this a different way before too, but uh, so that'll take care of take care of our thetas for that. We do the usual bit where I also do it for my population predictions. And then when I come down here uh, and make a call to our two compartment model, notice for the theta in here, I'm passing a, a matrix into this thing. So it's a matrix where yeah, I left it blank here, but which is okay. That means it's going to pass all the columns. So it's actually going to pass, uh, actually how many columns will this have? It's going to have... Uh, let's see, K goes from 1 to 3, so that's going to go up to 11. So I guess it's going to have 11 columns in it for all of our parameters. And then it's going to have a number of rows, which is going to be from uh, going from start I to, or start J to NJ here. So that's going to be all of the, it'll have a number of rows equal to the number of observations for that individual. Uh, and assuming weight is not constant over time, that would then, you would end up with piecewise constant parameter values being passed in, uh, into these. And when you run that, after that, things pretty much look just like they did before. I went ahead and did this one also, where I have the uh, observations, the loop over observations embedded inside the overall loop over subjects, and everything else is the same. So the parts that are different then are just that you've now got a matrix here where the number of rows in that matrix are actually the same as the number of elements in all of these other vectors uh, that, are, that are in your call to the bugs model library function. Uh, and then the other part is what we've done here where we have to calculate some normalized value here for our subject specific parameters and then adjust them for covariates uh, and that can you can do it that way uh, one other approach you can use uh, is you could instead choose to use more of the non mem style approach of of actually call of creating adas you know which would be uh, subject specific random effects that are centered at zero uh, and then work with those uh, within within a loop like the one here. Uh, the only warning I give to you on that is I find that that doesn't always work appropriately. Let me quiet that down here. Excuse me. Uh, is What you'll often find is that will actually introduce some um, some mixing and convergence problems uh, when you do it that way you're better off if you're if the um, if the IIV you know our inter-individual variation distribution here is centered uh, somewhere near the means that you're actually going to be wanting to work with here rather than setting it, setting it to a fixed value like zero uh, so there are times when you kind of get forced into it, but if you can avoid it, you're better off in terms of MCMC performance. Okay, so I think that's I think that's pretty much the story on that here. I'm trying to think what I might have skipped over too quickly. No, uh, any questions on that?
Okay, nothing popping up right away here. Let's uh, just go ahead and wander back up to the next topic in these. Let's uh, skip back down to where we were here. Okay, um, what I wanted to go over next here is is the option you have available uh, in here of considering other distributions, other other than distributions other than normal, to describe uh, the unexplained interindividual variation in your model parameters. Uh, so, seeing that we've used multivariate normal, and certainly most of the maximum likelihood tools out there, like non-mem and some of the others. Are, are for the most part restricted to that but there are reasons why you might want to entertain something else on some occasions uh, and one nice thing about wind bugs is it permits a range of other other distributions are built in uh, particularly for univariate distributions the the list of um, multivariate distributions is a bit smaller uh, but there are some options that you can explore there um, now one example I mention here uh, is suppose you you go ahead and try the normal distribution and you find that when you take a look at the empirical distribution uh, distributions of your individual model parameters uh, they might look like they're maybe a bit fatter tailed than a normal distribution uh, or in other cases you may find that you have the occasional sort of unusual inter individual that seems to be particularly uh, influential on some of the parameter estimates and you may feel that may be uh, inappropriately influential uh, in which case you might like your model to be a bit more robust to those sorts of outlying individuals well in either of those cases a multivariate t distribution uh, might be a reasonable choice uh, to use uh, in that instance and that turns out to be actually quite easy uh, to implement uh, in the bugs framework. Uh, you'll find that implemented in this ME hands-on 3 tdist folder. Uh, let's go ahead and wander off to that. Uh, let's see, let's close that one. Okay, so I had one here that I, this ME hands-on 3T dist. Oh, again, let's get rid of some of this junk we don't need. Let's grab the model. And this one won't take too long to show you because there isn't a lot that changes. Okay, uh, and in fact, the big change is right there. Uh, it's that one line, uh, and where instead of having a multivariate normal, which was noted as DM norm, if you recall right here, I've used the multivariate T, DMT. See, so let's bring up the help file here just to show you. to sort of remind you some of the options that are available while we're at it. But in particular, if we go down to our continuous multivariate distributions, again, we've been using the uh, multivariate normal here, but what I'm talking about now is the multivariate t. And the multivariate t distribution is a function of, of three parameters now. We have a mean parameter, or which they labeled here as mu. We have a scale parameter, which actually isn't, uh, it's related to the variance, but it isn't really, but it isn't the variance directly. Um, and in fact, I don't, unfortunately, they hadn't written it here, and I didn't think to go scribble down before I got here the exact relationship to the variance, but there is a relationship to the variance, but it involves both this scale parameter t as well as the um, the degrees of freedom. 
Uh, and then we have the last parameter they've called K here, which is a number of degrees of freedom in this. So we can we can just go ahead and use that. Uh, the first two parameters, well, the first one is the mean. The second one, though not exactly the variance, is closely related and pretty much what you would have used for a variance you can substitute in. Uh, into that as part of the model fitting process. And then we need a number of, of degrees of freedom. So let's go back to the model itself. Okay. And so I've got the DMT. I've got my, uh, my log theta mean, just like we did back in hands-on 3. I've got my omega inverse here. Uh, so again, uh, the t distribution again is is, is parameterized like the uh, like the normal here. It's in terms of I guess it's not quite again it's not a quite a precision, but it's an inverse of the scale matrix here, which is again related to the uh, precision, and then the degrees of freedom. Uh, the other part to think about here is is whether or not you're just going to put a fixed value of degrees of freedom or actually attempt to estimate it. Um, the way I've written it in this example is I've actually got it set up to be estimated. Uh, if we scroll down here you'll see I've got a uh, the stuff we've got near the bottom here is everything is you know this component of it is the same as we did before for both the our mean, our well, but this is the way that was our residual variance there. That was uh, our precision matrix and uh, variance matrix in the case of normal. And so it's our scale matrix here. Uh, and then for degrees of freedom, I stuck a uh, a prior here that goes from one to a hundred. Uh, as I recall, actually, let's take a look. I think I think bugs won't let you go less than one. In fact, I'm not even sure if it'll let you go less than two. Let's see what it says. I forget. Uh, in fact, it won't go less than two, so I probably ought to put a two in there. So uh, what I should probably do is put a two. Um, the t-distribution actually is defined down to one. As I recall, the one is equivalent to a Cauchy um, distribution, but um, but that is not implemented. Uh, implemented in bugs, so we, I guess we should bound it below by two. Once you start getting up into the, you know, the the high multiples of ten, you're essentially getting the same thing as a normal distribution anyway. A hundred is actually overkill on this. So if you find that you try to do something like this and the posterior distribution is consistently being pushed towards the higher end of this range, uh, it probably makes sense just to collapse it back to a normal distribution anyway. So, and again, alternatively, some people just to force some additional robustness actually put fixed values for the degrees of freedom somewhere in a relatively low number, somewhere between, you know, 2 and 20, say. So let's see, is there anything more to tell you about that? Probably not much, because the R script on this wouldn't change other than that you have to provide an initial estimate for the degrees of freedom. Otherwise, the, uh, the, uh, R, the R script would be the same. I think if there was any other change, I don't think so. Nope. Okay. Boy, we went through those quicker than I thought. Okay, we may have a shorter uh, lecture today. Okay, let's uh, scoot on. I close that to the next one. Uh, and this is still along the themes of considering other other possible distributions. Uh, in here, and uh, you know another variation on the, our IIV distributions would be a mixture model of some kind. Uh, and what I'll look at here in particular is to uh, explore the idea of modeling our inter-individual variation in terms of a mixture of normal distributions. Uh, and and to do that, I'll, again, I'll do it by example. 
and let's just consider the case of a uh, of a mixture of just two normal distributions, though the basic notion uh, is extendable up to an arbitrary number of them, though once you get above a certain number, the identifiability starts getting to be a problem. But this is another way of trying to make you know, to, to deal with things where maybe you've got some multimodality uh, or maybe you're deliberately trying to come up with something that's sort of a semi-parametric approach to the inter-individual variation. But let's stick with the, the first, just the simple case of a mixture of two. In particular, what I'm going to do is actually, st what I started with here was that um, the example that we called hands-on three uh, PBIIV, uh, where I just had a bivariate normal on clearance and volume, uh, and then a univariate normal on KA, and no uh, inter individual variation on Q and V2. So we're going to use that as our starting point, but we're going to replace that bivariate normal on clearance and V1 with a mixture of two bivariate normals. And there's different ways we could write that, but the way I've written it here. Is I'm just going to say then that the log of uh, of our vector here of clearance in V1 for the jth individual then is going to be it's going to be normal, normally distributed uh, with a and here we've got our dose adjusted clearance here, but where our clearance hat here notice it has a subscript k. Same thing is true for our V1. I've got a subscript k. And our and our variance matrix also has a subscript K, and in this case K is going to be either one or two, and it's going to be a and and it's going to be generated from a categorical distribution, which will give K of the value of one with the probability equal to P mix, and it will be true or it will be a two with the probability one minus P mix. So what that means then is that this our our vector here is going to be sampled from a essentially from a choice of two different bivariate normals that have possibly different means and variances and and which one of the which one of the bivariate distributions they come from is determined by this parameter which is sampled from the you know, from this categorical distribution. Another way you can think of it is that you can really just think of K here as really being Bernoulli, uh, since we're only uh, doing it as a choice of two. But this notion, uh, the way I've tried to write it here, is this is fairly easily scaled to more than two, uh, two such normal distributions. We could still use a categorical with a, a vector of P's where the vector is more than two. Uh, and then the rest of the parameters I just left as is. So we've just got log Ka is just going to be a univariate normal. Uh, and Q and V2 are weight adjusted, but otherwise have no unexplained inter-individual variation. So let me show you uh, one way to implement this kind of a mixture then uh, using wind bugs. Uh, that's done uh, using the uh, R script and and bugs model in the ME2 hands on 3 mix folder. Let's go ahead and grab the model since that's where most of the work is happening. Okay, there it is. Oh, where is it? Oh no, that's the. Uh, let's get rid of some of that. Okay. Okay. There's here's where let's see most of this is just uh, a few comments on top, but right. Okay, this is where where the mixture work is happening, uh, right in this segment here that I've highlighted. So we've got, just like I sort of wrote in the note, 
mathematical notation, we have our this our this log CLV1, which is going to be a for the J subject. So you can see it's going to return a vector of two values. Unless you see the one to two, so that'll be the vector of values for the J subject. Uh, we're going to do that from a bivariate normal, uh, and you can see we've got our mean, which is going to be generated down below. I'll show you how where that comes from in just a minute. So we take our log of this is a so this is a this is uh, specific to subject J again. So you can see it's got the J uh, index here. So that's going to be our means. Uh, notice now for the omega matrix or for the inverse omega matrix here, our precision matrix, that it's actually an array uh, with three dimensions. The last two give us the, our two by two variance matrix. But the first one you can see is indexed by this quantity here, I mix. Uh, which is specific to individual J. And that IMIX value is being generated down here from our categorical distribution. So the I so the IMIX then, in fact let's flip back up to what we saw before. The IMIX is actually, in fact maybe I should have used this since I use K here. Whoops, sorry, I crossed it out. Uh, IMIX is the same thing as K uh, in this notation right here. So, so IMIX is playing the role of that. It comes from our categorical distribution. Uh, PMIX here, PMIX is actually itself is a vector of two values. Uh, again, when it's on the right-hand side, I actually don't have to say 1 to 2 in here. It's okay to just to leave it blank to indicate it's there. Uh, but PMIX is, itself is a, is a vector of two values. And assuming I wrote this right, though that should be defined down somewhere here. Uh, do, 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 do. Yes, that happens down here. Uh, and here we introduce what may be unfamiliar to you, something called a Dirichlet distribution uh, to generate that. So, by the way, n mix here. I, again, I tried to write this so it would fairly easily gener generalize to a mixture of more than two distributions, but in our case here, n mix is two. So, so p mix here then is going to be a vector of two values. Uh, the way I've written it, uh, they're going to come from a prior, a Dirichlet prior here, uh, and the parameter here happens to be a vector with the same number of uh, indices, same number of components as the thing on the left hand side. Uh, in this case I gave alpha a value, uh, it's a vector just that consists of two ones which essentially says uh, that the two thing, you know, both uh, being the mix, sorry, one item is equally probable as the other which means the mean of this Dirichlet distribution for those two components would just be a half uh, when it actually does them. So the the mean here of p-mix would actually be uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 uh, in this. So that would be a fairly, uh, you know, uninformative prior here, assuming you think that saying that they're the two options are equally likely is uninformative. Uh, in here. So that's what we use to generate the p-mix values from that prior distribution. Let me go back up to the top. Okay, and then it's going to take that pair of probabilities which have to, they'll sum to one. Uh, so in, in the notation I had used up here, uh, p-mix in the bugs thing is actually the combination of what I called P mix here and one minus P mix. Okay, so that gives us our I mix, which will have a value of one or two. Uh, and then let's see, so that was, I was talking about that in referring to picking off the appropriate thing here. So the overall omega 
what I called omega CLV1 inverse is actually going to be, think of that as being really like a list of two, two by two uh, uh, precision matrices here. One that corresponds to the case where I mix is one and one that corresponds to the case where I mix is two. And the I mix value will pick off uh, the appropriate one. Uh, the other place where that comes up is right here where I generate my volume and my clearance. Actually, it's in the other order, clearance and volume. Uh, and I will have a this log of clearance hat. I'll have two val. That will be a vector of two values, one that corresponds to one of the two distributions and the other corresponding to the other one. And so you can see to pick off the appropriate one, again, I, it's indexed by I mix J again. Same thing for our volume and distribution. And then I do the, the weight adjustment as before, as you can see in both of those. So that will finally generate my subject specific value for my volume and my clearance. Uh, and that's what gets passed as the mean then uh, up here which finally generates the, the real individual specific of value of volume and clearance. Uh, let's see, I think that's everything that pertains to the mixture itself in here. Um, now you have to keep track again, you've got various pieces. Instead of having log clearance hat being a single value, it's going to be two values. Um, you know, and instead of the variance matrix being uh, just a single matrix. It's actually going to be a a uh, an array where you basically smush together two variance matrices. So I have to deal with that down in the uh, prior distributions. So here you can see. Oh, and I see there's one other issue here that I'll tell you in a second too. So we've got some stuff going on right here. Notice that I'm taking a loop over 1 to n mix, which again is 2 in, in our specific example. Uh, and we generate, we, we have priors for a bunch of components. I have something here that I'll explain in a second called log delta clearance hat. Then I have my log of v1 hat, so I've got priors. But there's going to be two such values again for both of those. Uh, this is just uh, converting them back to the original scale instead of log scale. Uh, and then here's doing, recall before where we had to generate our omega inverse. Uh, we did that using a Wishart prior in here. Well, again, I have to do that twice, once for each of the two mix components of our mixture. Uh, ditto if I want to get back the variance matrix itself for each of those. Um, and then, now, part of the question here is why the log delta clearance hat, and let's see if I can explain that appropriately. One problem when you have a mixture like this is the two components of the mixture are sort of symmetric with each other, and if you don't put some sort of order restrictions on something, you end up with an identifiability problem. Uh, when you try to characterize these two distributions because they it's basically like a, a flip-flop situation where okay well is, is the first mean the biggest one or is the second mean the biggest one and things like that and they can easily flip and you end up with um, with the mixture not really working and where you have real convergence and mixing problems because of it. Uh, the trick here is to enforce an order constraint and in particular the way I did it here is I chose to put the order constraint on one of the two parameters, specifically clearance. So what I've done is I originally defined uh, sort of my base parameters, something I call log delta clearance hat and then I, the first clearance hat 1 is simply going to be the first of those values, but then the second of those is going to be the sum of the first clearance hat plus the, de the second clear the clearance, uh, the delta clearance hat for the second one, so that I'm forcing clearance hat 2 to be greater than clearance hat 1. So again, I put an order constraint on the clearances. 
uh, in that manner. And all of this stuff is doing that coupled with converting the logs to, uh, uh, to the original scale and vice versa. So that's just to enforce, again, to enforce the identifiability. And again, just remind you here, the, uh, the way we get our, our mixture probability here is, again, using that Dirichlet prior for, for that. Actually, I should probably show you that, too. Let's see, do I have, I guess I closed the user manual. Let's go back to our distributions. In case you wanted to see what, the, what a Dirichlet distribution is or how it's shown here. Uh, that's right here. Basi by the way, basically you can think of a Dirichlet distribution as being a multivariate analog of a beta distribution. Uh, so if you recall, a beta distribution is a distribution that uh, for where, well, beta distributed variables are restricted between 0 and 1. Uh, and you know, and can take a variety of shapes over that particular interval. Uh, well, the Dirichlet distribution is again sort of a multivariate analog, where now you've got this multivariate collection of things that are between zero and one, but with the additional restriction that they also that this that they sum to one. Uh, as part of that. So, and here you can just see it described here. I don't know if there's a whole lot I can say about what it looks like, but the key here I was pointing out is notice that each of these values, you can see they use the name P for a random variable here, it says each of them is between 0 and 1, and they all sum to 1 uh, in this case. In fact, I think. I'd have to double check, but I think in the special case where you have a vector of two values, I think each of them is each of them actually is beta distributed. Though I'd have to double check with make with the accuracy of that statement. Okay, let's see. That one felt like I had thrown a fair amount at you for the mixture model. Any any questions on that? Okay, nothing coming up so far. Let's uh, wander back up. So again, that is fairly easily extended to more, more, you know, uh, more mixture components if you want. Let's uh, talk about one other topic here that we can illustrate uh, for these, and that's dealing with missing covariate data. And I've certainly seen a number of different approaches that have been used uh, in the population PK context. Sometimes it's just taking something like a mean or a median uh, of the values of all the other subjects in there. Uh, there are other approaches where sometimes people will attempt to model uh, the relationships between maybe some of the covariates and use that to infer values for the, for the missing quantities. And um, in there, other other times people just throw things out, uh, throw out data in those cases. But there's there's a number of options that are out there. Um, but well, I'll just mention that one of the better, uh, well, I say non-Bayesian ways. Actually, you could probably say one of the better ways to deal with missing covariate values, uh, regardless of whether we're talking about a Bayesian or non-Bayesian framework is something called multiple imputation. And basically what multiple imputation involves is you model the relationship among multiple covariates, even those that might not be used in the main model, but, but that you have available to you. Uh, you model the relationships among them, 
uh, and then you use that model to simulate the missing covariate values. Uh, then you take those simulated values and you you take a, create a data set where you augment the data set by replacing the missing covariate values with the simulated ones and you analyze the, the resulting data set. Then the idea is to now repeat that multiple times. In other words, you, you do your, presumably these simulations aren't completely deterministic. Uh, there's probably a stochastic component to them. Assuming they are, if you do multiple simulations, you'll get different different uh, imputed values. So the idea is you do uh, you, you do simulate multiple values and you do multiple analyses uh, using the different simulated values for the for the missing covariates and then you essentially average over the results uh, of those multiple analyses and that's sort of the classic notion of doing multiple imputation. Well fortunately in a when we're working in a Bayesian setting, particularly a Bayesian setting where we're doing the analysis by uh, posterior simulation, you can actually just embed or incorporate the covariate model right inside your overall model. So, so we would actually, in the in the case of a bugs framework, then we would construct whatever this model is relating our the model covariates with possibly other uh, covariates. We can model those um, in a single go right along with the main model of interest here. And when doing that, then multiple imputation is done pretty much simultaneous with the model fitting process. Uh, so instead of doing that sort of a two-step or sort of iterative process that you would do in a non-Bayesian setting, you do it all in one go. It's all handled simultaneously. And that's what I was going to illustrate in a fairly simple case uh, with our ME hands-on 3 data. Uh, so I'm going to take that data. Uh, I'm going to just throw out some of the, you know, art, rather artificially here, uh, eliminate some of the data in here so we've got some missing values in here uh, and analyze that. So there's a uh, folder uh, that I posted called ME2 Hands-On 3 MISSCOV. Uh, and in the folder that I posted, it's an example where we do have some missing body weight values and we impute that by modeling the joint distribution of weight and age. Uh, and we do that by gender. Uh, so for each gender we end up, in this case, I'm just going to do it fairly simply as a set of bivariate normals. Uh, I suppose I could have logically maybe done it as uh, maybe bivariate log normals. Might have been a logical choice too since weight and age have to be uh, non-negative. But for now we'll just do it as bivariate normals uh, and illustrate how you could implement that. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So that's in the one called, where did we go? There we are. Emmy hands on three Miss Cove here. Uh, let's get rid of the junk again. Let me grab the model. Okay, uh, most of the stuff at the top isn't going to look any different from what we did before. In fact, I think I just lifted, uh, let's see, I think, uh, yeah, I just lifted the ME hands-on three example uh, as is for the most part. So the first part here is where we're generating our uh, individual specific random effects up here almost identical. The one thing that's different here is I have to do a little uh, little bit of junk to deal with the fact that I'm going to have to model these bivariate normal distributions so I have to combine weight and age uh, together as a vector. Uh, so that's what you'll see here for example. So uh, in the original uh, in the original thing you saw weight as just a, a separate covariate it's now bound together as a vector here that I just called weight age. 
uh, and the first element of that vector will always be weight. The second one will be age. So you can see the way I did this. So instead of where it said before it had weight start I, it's now weight age start I, and then I had to put the uh, the additional uh, thing to say pick off the uh, the first column there, uh, which would be the weight. If I had put a 2 there, it would correspond to age. And you'll see that going through all, then, of the uh, calculations here. You see the weight age thing being mentioned. So the question is, is where did the weight age thing come from? Well, part of it came from passing it as data, uh, but the data had some missing values in it. So how do we come up with dealing with the missing values? Because if you actually tried to pass uh, an NA on the right-hand side of any of these equations, like here, so if I passed in the original weight age um, matrix in there, and if it had some NAs for the weight component in there, uh, I would have gotten an error, and it wouldn't have run. So I have to fill them in somehow. And where that's going to happen uh, is right down here. Oop, I just saw a question I hadn't spotted before. Uh, the question was, is there any limit to uh, to how many missing values? Well, uh, sort of in terms of the mechanics of the programming, no. But realistically, if the fraction of your data, you know, if the fraction of missing values is very high, uh, you're going to end up with um, a lot more uncertainty in the you know, in any attempt to characterize the dependence of your predictions on those parameters. Also, chances are your predictions themselves uh, will end up uh, being more uncertain as a result. Uh, the other thing you may run into is if the fraction of missing values is particularly large, you may find that you run into some convergence problems too along the way. Uh, I haven't dealt with any cases like that, so I'm not sure just how bad it would be. So, But that would be my guess, uh, is that you'd, basically you'd end up with identifiability problems that in turn would cause convergence problems if it's too large. But how large is too large, I'm not certain. Let's see, the other question I have is, do I have an example for modeling censored DV data? Um, well, actually, that's hands-on 3 does have censored uh, DV data. Uh, and in fact, I, I think I continued that through. Uh, and it depends what you mean by censored, but I have it censored because of data being below the limit of quantitation. Uh, and that's what uh, this portion of the exercises is related to. Uh, let's see here. Okay, let's me. Where was I going? Oh, yeah. I was going to point out what I'm doing now. This is basically our model describing the relationship between uh, weight and age. Uh, in here now. By the way, I made an assumption that isn't actually stated here. I'm I'm is, I've, I'm modeling uh, weight the relationship between weight and age as bivariate normal, and but where it's a different bivariate normal distribution depending upon gender. Uh, in doing it the way I have done it here, I'm making the assumption that there are no missing values for gender. Uh, if there were, there, there are things we could do to bring that into the picture, too. Uh, but, I, but I haven't done that in this particular case. I mean, I could, you know, in addition, model gender uh, as a, you know, as a Bernoulli uh, variable or something like that. But in this case, I don't need to worry about that because I don't have any missing values there. So you can see here I've got bivariate normal. I've got... Uh, you know, my for weight and age here, I'm going to have some mean, and I call that weight age hat in here. Uh, and of course, that's going to be a vector of two values for each gender. 
uh, and then my omega inverse or my precision matrix for weight and age is going to be for each gender will be a two by two matrix and again I've got to have a separate one for each gender so actually what I'm dealing with here in this case for this I've got a two by two by two array and in the case of the weight age hat I've got a two by two uh, matrix to describe that uh, and let's see so that will generate then th that will be treated as something that's going to be fit so r really this is a likelihood for that so weight age then uh, on the left hand side are generally going to be data but some of those data points are going to be NAs for at least one of the components uh, and it's and it's those that are going to be in a sense of most interest because when they are NAs uh, this equation will instead instead of serving as a likelihood for those cases will actually serve as a simulation tool so if uh, if you have components there where weight uh, where the weight is missing it's actually going to simulate a value of weight conditioned on the value of age assuming that's not also missing for that individual uh, and and that that simulated value will get used back up here in the calculations that we have on top so if so if weight age is observed it's going to plug in the observed value here but if if weight age or if, say weight in particular is not observed it's going to plug in a simulated value for that body weight instead into this and so that when we do the fitting overall in effect what it does for those individuals is it's essentially going to be averaging over the posterior distribution for that individual's body weight let's see what else do I need to tell you about it down here we've got um, we have to provide priors for everything so down here for the means for our weight and volume of distribution here I'm sorry not weight weight and age I've got some priors here uh, in this case I put half normals on them so you can see where I've got I use this flat normal here normal with a variance of 10 to the 6 but then I put this I 0 comma so that's actually giving us a normal distribution truncated below at 0 so you're only going to get so it's a half normal if you like uh, ditto here for age and then for our uh, omega inverse here our precision matrix for that it's going to yeah, excuse me I'm going to use a Wishart prior again for that uh, again I used a uh, degrees of freedom of two so it's a relative it's a weakly informative prior on that and notice that this is inside of a loop that goes from 1 to 2. In other words, it's going to generate one set of values for females and one for males for all of those components. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's see. I think if there was anything else that was different in here, I don't believe so. think that's pretty much the whole tale in here so the point is is you know if you think you can come up with a plausible model relating various covariates and as I say not necessarily covariates in the model notice that in the primary in our PK model we're only using weight we're not using age I'm only using weight and, and for and gender too the only places I use weight and gender are in the context of modeling the relationships among the parameters and it's and and then ultimately using that to impute values for weight uh, for my PK model so this could be you know arbitrarily more complicated uh, in some cases you may have some you know also good strong prior information about the relationships about these components which in turn you could bring in uh, bring into this model the way I did it here I didn't I relied pretty much entirely upon the uh, empirical distributions of weight age and gender within the trials uh, that contribute to our data set
but certainly something like weight, age, and gender, you could also bring in, you know, all kinds of external information to inform that interrelationship here. Well, we did go through this stuff faster than I thought we would. Okay. Hopefully not so fast that I've left everybody in the dust here in the meantime. Uh, let's see if I've got much more to go. Oh, let's see, we've got something coming up here. Okay, I was just getting the clarification about dealing with missing concentration values due to LOQ, for example. But hopefully that, will, uh, and I guess there, I'd, in terms of that topic, I would refer you to, I'm trying to remember if that was, I think it was in last week's lecture uh, that I spent um, some time on the censoring process. And so for the dependent variable uh, in your model, then that's where we would talk in terms of censoring instead of uh, whereas if with covariates it's not, it's not necessarily a censoring problem in the same sense but for the dependent variable uh, again the the approach there is using the I'm trying to get down to there it is using this modifier on the distribution here where in this particular case using that I uh, function modifying my normal distribution is basically saying that okay the constant I know the concentration value may be missing but I know it's missing because it has to be less than this uh, this limit of quantitation here uh, and that would that would take care of the information content of that piece of knowledge that you have that it's less than LOQ But the what we're talking about for the covariates, where it's an independent variable, it plays a little bit different role. Okay, let's see. I think, yeah, I think that was that was as far as I was going to take it in terms of main content here. Uh, let's see, I notice I might have had another question come up. Let's see. Okay, I think we're fine there. Uh, certainly, if you want to ask more questions here, the other things that I should mention in terms of uh, where we're going to go on the course, I guess there's two things. One is, I guess, come up with a homework assignment here, which we're going to make a little bit more uh, informal uh, for this particular week. Uh, and in fact, well, why don't I go ahead and do that now. Uh, for homework, I didn't actually create a, a page here. Uh, what I would really propose, you know, since we kind of ran through these things fairly quickly, is one, that you do spend some time going over the five examples that we talked about today uh, and thinking about how you use them. And as a homework assignment uh, that we could actually go over uh, on Thursday, let, let me suggest that what you do is let's actually combine a couple of these elements here. And in particular, uh, what I'm going to suggest is that you actually do to basically take the whoops, take the Emmy hands on three PBIIV example. Uh, and let's take that a step further. So take that one and also put a do the same thing except let's also put a bivariate normal on Q and V2 and and do that as part as an exercise and then and then after you do and then augment that still further to explore one of these other items let's go ahead and have you now let's not go through the mixture model. Let's uh, let's let me suggest you also incorporate what we did here in the missing covariate case. Uh, oh, and I know I do remember one thing I didn't show you. Uh, the way I did this is somewhat artificial, but it's but it will suggest a way you could do it for the exercise here. Um, let me see. Do I have R still open? Yes. 
You get the R script from the missing uh, covariates case here. Okay, what I did here is, again, it's kind of artificial, but uh, where'd it go here? Somewhere in here. Yeah. Uh, is I just, I introduced, you know, I, I took the original data set, which had no missing values in it, and just as part of the exercise here, went through and just cut out, randomly cut out 10% of the baseline weight values in here. Uh, so you can see the lines here where I did that. So what I propose is that, uh, let me go back again on top, so that go ahead and do, again, do the, uh, do the example here, but put a bivariate normal on Q and V2. In addition, uh, why don't you do the uh, case of missing covariates, uh, where you've got missing weight values in the same manner in which I did it for the uh, for this particular example. So combine those elements to try and get some sort of hands-on experience working with it. Uh, go ahead and use the same approach I did to somewhat artificially generate the missing covariate values just so that you can uh, get some experience working with that. And we can go over the, the solution to that on Thursday. Uh, a couple other things coming up. Uh, one, uh, I see we've actually got a question here relating to one of them. Uh, we're, we're overdue for a midterm exam. Uh, I'm going to target getting that ready for you by uh, by Thursday. The way it's actually going to work is it will for the midterm. It's just going to be a multiple choice, maybe some true false uh, kinds of things. It'll actually be administered using the uh, using the course website. It has some uh, some quiz making capabilities and quiz taking capabilities in there. So I will be doing that and sending out the information on that hopefully by this Thursday uh, when we go over this. Uh, the other thing is, is there's a course project and I also need, I'll also put together an outline for that and post that for you uh, so that that'll be available before the end of the week. Uh, and in fact, next week will be a great time to get started on both of those elements because we're actually not going to be having any course next week. Uh, I'll, I'll also post that on the, on the course website for those that might not have attended today. Uh, I'm actually going to be running around the UK next week. And uh, we've still got on our schedule enough remaining weeks uh, before the last course on December 16th to still have all, I believe it was 12 uh, 12 weeks in here so I'm going to go ahead and take advantage of that and uh, take that week off the courses so they'll actually be that week off then we'll be on a week and then I think it's the week after that is Thanksgiving week when we're off again uh, in there so let's see did I get all the pieces so we've got the midterm coming up I'll hand out the project information uh, and next week we'll be off uh, so but anyway, we still have that one more meeting this Thursday here to go over the results here, and uh, hopefully I'll have the uh, the exam and project outline for you by then. Uh, I think that's all I've got for today. Uh, if there's uh, any last questions or anything here. Okay, nothing coming up yet anyway. Uh, I guess I uh, have a good uh, next couple of days here, and I'll talk to you again on Thursday. So bye for now.